Well, God bless you all, House of Praise family and YouTube family and Facebook family. I just know that this is going to be a great day today. God is doing good things and he's blessing us in so many ways and the blessing of God is rich. Amen. And it's such a beautiful thing. So we, we thank God for that. We thank God for the privilege we have of filling the airwaves with the gospel message. And that's what we're going to do here again today, the gospel message in the form of looking at the end times and understanding the end times and the sequence of events in the book of Revelations so that we can share the gospel message more effectively. And that's our goal. Amen. The goal is to share the gospel message with many to lead them to Jesus Christ. And that's our goal. Amen. So let's pray together and let's uh, get right into the Word of God here today. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you, God, for all that you have done. Thank you for every blessing. Lord, nourish us now with the Holy Spirit. And Father, may the power of the Holy Spirit just come upon us in a very special way. Anoint us, O oh God, and give us divine direction and wisdom as we look into the book of Revelations. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. I'm just excited. I, I, I just can't wait to share what God has told me to share today. On Sunday, we had an outside service and it was like a little Bible trivia time on the book of Revelations. We had a good time, a lot of interaction. It was, it was a, just a great picnic type atmosphere that we had uh, in our service on Sunday morning. It was really good. And the word of God was rich in a very unique and different way. But the Holy Spirit has told me now for this Thirsty Thursday that I need to <clears throat> just bring this all together and paint the big picture. That's what the Holy Spirit told me to do. He told me to paint the big picture of the book of Revelations. Now, this is not every detail of the book of Revelations. That's not what I'm saying this is. It's not. It doesn't cover every detail, but it covers a lot of really important points that we need to understand. And, uh, you know, Jesus really is pleased that we're reading this book. It's very important to our Lord that we know and understand this prophecy. And uh, in fact, he's actually offered some incredible blessings for those who would even read it. And uh, so it's going to be a good thing. So uh, I'm just very thankful for this privilege that we have of being together here in this Thirsty Thursday session. You know, there's no higher priority in my mind or in any of our minds, I'm sure, other than to uh, become in a great relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the Lord Jesus that we saw in the four Gospels and, and the New Testament as we know it today uh, was so incredible. What an incredible man of God Jesus was. What an incredible Messiah. I mean, you know, born of a virgin, this incredible life that he lived. Everything was done in power, birthed in power, lived in power, you know, performed miracles in power, died in power, resurrected in power. I mean, every part of Jesus was the power of God manifest. And uh, what an incredible experience it is to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus. Now, John the Revelator, John the Apostle, was used of God to get this revelation, which was signified by an angel from Father God, down to him, and he has passed it on to us, um, a revelation of Jesus Christ in a different way. And we're going to see Jesus in the book of Revelations in his eternal state, in his resurrected state, totally different than what we saw him in the four Gospels. And uh, it's so phenomenal when John had this vision of Christ and, and it was phenomenal when he writes down what he saw when he saw the resurrected Christ. It was so much like what Daniel saw and what he wrote. I mean, it was almost identical. It was phenomenal. And uh, so what, what John saw even to get started with this incredible revelation was phenomenal because Jesus was actually seen walking among candlesticks or lampstands, whatever you want to call it, which represented the church, okay, the church of Jesus Christ. There was seven churches that were, that were uh, pointed out that uh, the Apostle Paul had started, and uh, 
uh, and, and, and these represent the church today as well, and I do believe that. So it wasn't just the churches of that day, it represents us today. So this was an incredible experience that John had when he started to get revelation of Jesus in his eternal resurrected state. And I feel a real sense of urgency on understanding this, so that's why I'm going to teach it and preach it the way you hear me preach it, because I, I really believe there's a sense of urgency. I believe the time is so close, and what must be done must be done quickly. Amen. You know, the uh, book of Revelations is based on a, on a Greek word, apocalypse, which simply means the unveiling or the revealing. And uh, it, it, it literally means that which is uncovered or that which is made known or make easy or made easy to understand. And this prophecy literally reveals the true Jesus Christ in his eternal state. Amen. And it was revealed by the intimate, mighty, almighty Father God, signified by an angel to uh, John, as we said. So a key... Um, a key description of Christ, like I, I mentioned before, is the fact that he's in his eternal state, but that he is seen walking among the candlesticks, which represents the church of Jesus Christ. And the stars in his right hand represented the angels of the churches. And uh, he is now in his glorified body. And that's what John sees him as in this incredible revelation. You know, there were seven churches that were pointed out by John, and Christ actually had powerful messages for every one of these churches. These were literal churches and uh, at that time, but now represent the church today, and I do believe that. And, a fi and finally, an example of our personal lives. Amen. We can look at each one of these churches and see ourselves. okay? And it's really important to understand that. The message to the church at Ephesus was that it was the church that lost its first love. What a sad story, because it was a powerful church. Started by the Apostle Paul, he spent three years there, appointed young Timothy as the pastor. What an incredible church this was in this great metropolitan area. But then it lost its first love. It didn't seem to have the same fire that it had at one time. We need to look at ourselves. Have we lost our first love? And this is really important to ask ourselves, not only in our church, but to ourselves personally as well. There was a message to the church of Smyrna, and this church was an alive church. It was a powerfully alive church and had no rebuke from Jesus Christ at all. The message to the church of Pergamos, that was a little different. It was guilty of tolerating weak teaching and false doctrine. And, and Christ actually had some, had some a real rebuke for this church and uh, of guilty of tolerating false doctrine and weak teaching. Now the church at Thyatira was even in a worse condition because it tolerated the evil spirit of Jezebel and guilty of tolerating this spirit, an evil controlling spirit, amen. And uh, that was a, a strong rebuke from Jesus Christ on that church. Then the message to the church at Sardis was, it was a dead church, but they thought they were alive. It was totally deceived, amen. It was a deceived church. They thought they were alive and really they weren't at all. They had no relationship with Christ. It was just nothing but a bunch of show. It was something that was not for real. And, and that was a rebuke coming from Christ as well. Then the message to the church at Philadelphia was really good. Good deeds with no rebuke at all. The only advice was hold fast to that which you have. Don't lose it. Amen. And then the church at Laodicea was labeled the lukewarm church. One foot in the Word of God, in a relationship with Christ, and then one foot outside. There was, it, 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 it's such a, it's such a sad state of affairs because it, it, it's deceiving. It makes you feel like there's something good happening, but there really isn't. Lukewarmness is really, in fact, at one point, um, he actually says that it made God sick. It actually made him spew you out of his mouth. That's the words that were used. And uh, it, it's really a not, not a good situation at all. Amen. So these were the messages to the churches that John really heard and wrote them all down. 
Uh, we have messages on that on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more detail, but I'm just painting you the big picture, the, the broad scope picture here in this teaching here today. Amen. What is John's first glimpse of the throne room of God? In chapter four and five, it describes his, his first experience as he went into the throne room of God. He saw Father God on his throne. He saw seven lampstands before the throne of God, 24 elders seated on 24 thrones. And he saw the sea before the throne, the four beasts and the myriads of angels, amen. And very keen insight and revelation is that his throne is his very existence. I believe that with all my heart. He's everywhere at the same time. Father God is omnipotent, which means he is uh, he is all powerful. He's he's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere at the same time. And he's also omniscient, which means that he's all knowing. And it's really important to understand those three attributes. So, you know, the tabernacles on earth, I'd like to mention this. This is so important here to mention this, that we have taught in our church Remember the tabernacle of Moses was designed by God and Moses followed it to every detail. And that was a place of the dwelling place of God at that time. A little later on, the tabernacle of David, okay, took place. And, and, and then the third tabernacle was Jesus when he was on earth. He was the dwelling place of God while he was here on earth. And then of course, the fourth tabernacle is who? It's us, it's the church because we are now the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. So we are the fourth tabernacle. And then the last tabernacle, which is mentioned in the Bible, is the eternal tabernacle, amen, which is when we are in heaven with Christ and uh, you know we'll experience it to a large degree during the millennium and then into um, the kingdom of God, the glory kingdom, which is mentioned with the new heaven and the new earth. So it's really important to understand that God has always had a dwelling place, amen. And uh, right now during the church age, it's us, okay? We are the dwelling place of God, amen. You know, the whole universe exists inside of God, and this is important to understand the transcendence of God because the existence of the Almighty Father God is way beyond the normal, beyond physical level, amen. So we tend to think of God dwelling in the universe. Really, it's the opposite. The universe and all the galaxies and the billions of stars all dwell inside of him. Amen. So it's important to understand that. He is unknowable and unsearchable by nature. His holiness and righteousness is beyond the reach of his creation. There is no question about it. And by his very nature, he must stay separate from us. Amen. Because of sin. Amen. We live in a fallen world. Okay, now, it's really important. There's a mystery that the, the Bible points out, and, and the Apostle Paul in particular had great revelation on, that there was a mystery of him drawing close to us. And, and that was through Jesus Christ, of course. Amen. And uh, Psalm 39 really does explain the imminence of God very, very well. And it's I would recommend you read prayerfully Psalm 139. God's throne is a place of power and authority, majesty and honor, perfect justice, sovereignty and holiness, of course, praise and worship, along with purity, amen, eternal life and the grace of God, which is God's riches at Christ's expense, amen. And one day all creation will bow to the majesty of God's throne. And we know that where he is, okay, is his throne. So we believe because of what the word of God tells us that we are now the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. We are the dwelling place of God, amen. So his throne is, is within the church, amen. And that's why it's so important we understand how God feels about the church and the mystery of the church has been revealed through the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, when, when, when John entered the throne room of God, Father God was holding a book in his hand. It was probably a scroll and had seven seals along the scroll. 
and uh, it was like a sealed book and and uh, the Bible doesn't say exactly what the book was but I believe it was the title deed to the earth without a doubt because all the earth belongs to Jesus Christ amen Jesus owns it all amen and we are co-inheritors with him amen more on that later amen so th th this is really important to understand this so there was a lot of weeping in heaven because there was no one that was present that was worthy to take the book out of the Father's hand and break the seven seals so that we could see, so that John, the revelator, could see what was in the book and, and, and understand the seals of the book. But then, of course, the angel said to John, don't weep, don't worry, Jesus has prevailed, amen. He is worthy. And uh, the event of breaking the seals was, was a magnificent time of worship among the elders and the myriads of angels and saints of God. I mean, I, we cannot begin to comprehend the worship level in the presence of God at that time when Jesus himself went up and took the book out of Father God's hands and said, I will open and break the seals of the book. Jesus was the only one that was worthy, the only one that was worthy to open the book and to break the seals. Amen. So Christ reveals what he sees in the seals. And he, and of course, the angel says to John, come and see. So John starts to write this down. The first thing he, he saw was a rider on a white horse. This was the revelation of the Antichrist. Amen. There was going to be an Antichrist revealed. Amen. To the earth. It's going to be an incredible thing because the Antichrist is not just against Christ, but he's also trying to imitate Christ, trying to be the Messiah, trying to be the Savior. Total deception. Amen. And this is incredible and important to understand. Then the next thing he saw was a red horse. And the rider on the, the red horse was a representation of what? Uh, the, the, the revealing of, of the prophecy of war and bloodshed like we have never seen up to this point on earth. The black horse was the next thing that he saw, the prophecy of spiritual Babylon. The prophecy of spiritual Babylon, amen. This is what, the corrupt financial system, the corrupt media, the corrupt business world, and all the corruption that exists here on planet earth called spiritual Babylon, amen. And then there was a fourth horse, and it was the pale horse, the prophecy of drug abuse and pandemic and death. That's what the fourth horse, the pale horse, represented. So the, these were great prophecies of what was to come shortly. Amen. Okay? The revealing of the Antichrist. Amen. The prophecy of war and bloodshed. The prophecy of spiritual Babylon which is the corruption of the finances and the media systems of this world and all the corrupt business proceedings. And then the pale horse representing drug abuse and pandemic and sickness and death. Oh my, these were... Now, there, there were some really good things that were revealed too. One of them was the martyrs of God. He saw that they were under the, the throne of God, un, under... Uh, it was like a place of security, a place of immunity. It was really a powerful thing that John saw. Every martyr that has ever died for the cause of Christ will get a special blessing from God and special treatment. I believe that with all my heart. And that's what this revelation was all about. Special blessing prepared for all martyrs. Amen. Then he saw this great earthquake. This earthquake is mentioned a number of times in the book of Revelation. This earthquake is so magnanimous. I mean, it's, it's enough to move mountains out of their place. It's enough to have islands sink into the sea. Can you imagine the Hawaiian Islands sinking into the Pacific Ocean? Can you imagine Mount Everest, the most magnificent mountain on the face of the earth, being moved out of its place? That kind of earthquake? Not something that's six or seven on a Richter scale. Not something that will down some buildings or whatever. We're talking about an earthquake that is meant to be a, a sign. A, a, a sign of the presence of God. There's no question in my mind about it. The last thing that was seen as the seals were broken was silence in heaven for 30 minutes. And it's not clear in scripture what that meant. There's some ideas from some students 
and I guess I have a few ideas myself, which we will not go into now, but there was a silence in heaven that followed those revelations. Now, the next thing that John saw was a really important thing. It was a large group of people, and we're going to call them the 144,000. Remember, I'm painting the broad picture here now of the book of Revelations and doing it in a very short period of time. The identity of this group were Jews. They were 12,000 from each tribe of the children of Israel, dedicated to serving God. A ton of scriptures to support this. And uh, God's seal will spare them from judgment and death. There was a an immunity put on this 144,000. And their mission is to preach the gospel, to evangelize the world during the tribulation period. And it was a securing of these servants and a special immunity put on each one. So that's a powerful thing to understand. You know, the rapture of the church... We're not sure exactly because it, it's an imminent event. We don't know. It could take place today. It could happen today. It could happen at any time. Jesus said that two would be in bed. One would be taken and the other left. Two would be in the field working the farm and one would be taken the other left. It's an imminent event. We don't know the timing of it. But we do know that it will be something that when it happens, we will be well aware of what's going on. There will be a trumpet sound. I believe it'll be the sound of, of shofars. I mean, it, it can be any kind of a trumpet. I'm just saying there will be a sounding of trumpet. Every eye shall see him. It'll be on the cloud with the saints. He will not come back to earth, but he will appear on the clouds and all the holy angels with him. Yes, there will be a great earthquake take place. This event will be announced by Father God. Amen. There's no question in my mind about it. The dead in Christ shall rise first, those who died saved, okay? And uh, this is the prophesied first resurrection. Blessed are those that are part of the first resurrection, the scripture says, and that their souls will be joined together with uh, this, this incredible glorified body that is prophesied in scripture. And then those of us that are alive at that point and remain uh, will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, tells us in 1 Corinthians 15. And we will get glorified bodies then. And then all of us will be caught up and that's what the word rapture means. It's a it's a it's a uh, uh, it's a Latin word for for being caught up, okay? For being you know brought in together with a relationship and a great union with Jesus Christ. The church being caught up in the clouds. Amen. Oh my! This is going to be an incredible event. It'll be the great reunion of Christ and His church. Amen. Not to be confused with the second coming of Christ. And that's, and that's really important to understand that. Now, we are going to be caught up. And of course, let's stay in heaven just for a moment. We're going to be taken to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Look at the YouTube teaching out there on the marriage supper of the Lamb. It'll be the great reunion between the bride and the bridegroom. Christ being the bridegroom and we are the bride of Christ, the church. Amen. And then the, the judgment seat of Christ will be the judgment of the righteous. And who will stand there? All who are saved. Yes, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where the rewards, that's where the crowns will be handed out. It'll be a phenomenal thing. We don't want to miss this incredible event. These are, these are events that will take place in heaven. But down here on earth... After the rapture has occurred and the church is removed, there's going to be total chaos down here. It's going to be phenomenal. The Antichrist will be revealed right after that. Amen. And this is going to be the, the Antichrist will be in a form of such an incredible savior, if you will. He's going to appear in total deception as the great savior of the world, having all the answers to all the problems. Amen. Oh, it's going to be incredible. And uh, so the, the, the revealing of the Antichrist, uh, which John saw as a beast coming out of the sea. Now, when Revelation talks about the sea, it's not talking about a body of water. It's talking about a body of people. OK, so it comes out of the sea, which is a which is a, a group of nations. Amen. And then then he also saw a beast coming out of the earth as well. This was representation of the false prophet, which was like a cohort of the Antichrist, and they worked together. 
This is Satan embodied in a man. Amen. Satan himself embodied in a man. This is going to be beyond anything that we can begin to comprehend after the rapture. The total chaos that will exist here will be beyond anything that we can imagine. And that's why it'll be perfect timing for this so-called savior, the Antichrist, will be revealed. And that's why we can read all about that in 2 Thessalonians in the second chapter. It really explains it in quite a bit of detail. Amen. We have teaching on that also out on the YouTube channel. Now, there's going to be another great warning. I believe the first set of warnings that God will, will institute, warning of the final wrath of God being poured out. I think the first set of warnings will be with the church. It's us. It's, it's, the, it's the church age. We're the first warnings. We are it. We're going to be used by God and are right now. Amen. That's really important. Then the rapture of the church will take place. The removal of the church from the earth. I mean, do you think, do you just might think that may cause some chaos and, and really get a lot of people's attention? Think about the media going crazy with that. I just can't begin to comprehend it. So think about it. God has all these series of warnings, okay? The next warning, okay, is very, very important, okay, is the 144,000 will be sent out by God. You imagine 144,000 people filled with the Holy Spirit, like, like Billy Graham's, for example, or whatever, out there evangelizing the world. It's going to be phenomenal, guys. That's going to be a powerful thing that God does. Now, another one of the warnings that will happen is right after the seal judgments and after that that seventh seal reveals seven angels with seven trumpets and this is what will happen with the blowing of the trumpets now listen carefully okay this is the trumpet judgments that will warn once again this is during the tribulation period amen hail and fire mingled with blood one third of all the trees and grass burned up Think about that. Mountains burning with fire. One third of all the water in the seas become blood. A great star falling from heaven. One third of the rivers and all the sources of water are poisoned. The sun, moon, and stars smitten. One third of all the light disappears from earth. The bottomless pit is open. The release of tormenting locusts. Men shall seek to die, but will not be able to die. I believe there are going to be demons tormenting spirits. Amen. There's no question in my mind about that. A great evil army will be released. One third of all the population will die. Can you imagine this being a warning from God saying this is not the final wrath of God, but this is another warning that is taking place. The declaration that kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. I don't know how to be any more emphatic than I'm being at this point, how important for this, for, uh, this is for us to understand when we are sharing the gospel, when we are reaching out to others who don't know Christ, we've got to understand this. And I don't mean to just focus on, ca on catastrophic events, but it's got to be part of the picture because it's real. It's very important. I will stand before God and God will ask me, did you tell them about this? And yes, I'll be able to answer in saying, yes, I told them. Amen. Then there'll be another warning. There'll be a, an angel flying through the sky. Everyone will see this angel, I believe, all over the earth. The angel with the little book. Another warning. It's, it's one of the many warnings that God gives prior to the pouring out of the wrath of God. And this will happen in the second 42 months of the Great Tribulation period. The actual meaning of the little book is unknown. Uh, some scholars believe it to be the book of Daniel, because in the book of Daniel there was so much accurate prophecy having to do with the end times. And the message of this angel will be very clearly, time is no more. In other words, the time has run out. The outpouring of God's wrath is upon us. This is so important. Then God will send two witnesses. Boy, you talk about a whole string of warnings, one after the other. 
After the church is raptured, God will commission two witnesses to represent him in the earth with darkness pressing all around. These two witnesses will shine the light of God's truth by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Much like their Old Testament predecessors, they will be true prophets, speaking revelation, performing miracles under the authority of Christ. Amen. And we read that in Revelations 11, 3 and 6. For three and a half years, they will warn the world of God's coming judgments. They will inspire faith in some, but yet hatred in others. Amen. Some will respond. Some will just hate them all the more. They will be unstoppable. I'm telling you, the power coming from these two witnesses will be unstoppable until they have finished their mission. And then the false prophet will have them assassinated. They will be assassinated. Imagine that. I mean, the, 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 this is incredible. They're going to lie in the streets, okay, dead for three and a half days. Oh, do you think the media will, will, will have, a, have a story there? Yes, they will. But then God's going to resurrect them. And they will be resurrected. They will stand up on their feet and be raptured. Amen. And taking up to heaven. Their mission will have been complete. Amen. This is so important. We don't know who those two witnesses will be. Their identity is not known, but most feel it will be Moses and Elijah. But we don't know that because the Bible is silent on that. Who are the Antichrist and the false prophet? Okay, it's, it's the beast rising out of the sea, which is a group of nations and a beast rising up out of the earth. And uh, these will be literally Satan embodied in the body of a man. Totally controlled by the devil. Amen. This is going to be the first 42 months will be nothing but deception. The second 42 months will be the pouring out of the wrath of God. And this is really important. You can read all about that in detail. Second Thessalonians 2 talks about that quite a bit. I've done teaching on that. It's really important to understand that. Paul was a, a great evangelist, a powerful apostle, church planter. He was a teacher. He was called rabbi without a doubt. But he also was a prophet. And he prophesied things very, 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 very powerfully. Now that last part of the tribulation period we're still on earth yet okay this is what's happening here the final pouring out of god's wrath okay which we refer to as the bold judgments or the vile judgments will be in the second 42 months of the tribulation period now this describes a little bit what will happen we'll just do this very quickly noisome and greasome sores on all who took the mark of the beast and that's the escape, okay? They take the mark of the beast. Now, now they are, uh, what, declaring loyalty to the Antichrist, and they are lost forever. Amen. Noisome and greasome sores who all took the mark of the beast. The sea becomes like the blood of a dead man, and all living creatures die. Amen. All the rivers and fountains of water become blood. Imagine that. Men scorch with great heat, but they repent it not to give God glory. Darkness poured out on all the sea of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. People gnawed their tongues with great pain. The Antichrist, the false prophet, doing miracles to deceive all this time. Rivers dry up. Evil spirits coming out from the devil. I mean, we cannot comprehend what the wrath of God will be poured out in the last 42 months of the tribulation period. We don't want our loved ones here, guys. Oh, I know some people say that there'll be a second chance to get saved during the tribulation, and that is true. The 144,000 will be evangelizing the world. The two witnesses will be out there. The, the angel, you know, flying around with the little book saying time is no more. All those warnings and all, all the, the trumpet, the seal and the, and the trumpet judgments that warn. Yes, they will have all of that. And yes, they can receive Christ during that period. It probably cost them their life. But it will be possible. Then let's talk about the second advent. 
at the end of the tribulation period, the second coming of Christ will take place. The return of Christ with his church and all of his holy angels. And they will foot, put their foot down on earth, okay? And then there will be a supernatural war fought called the Battle of Armageddon. Amen. Not one sword will be thrown or not one spear will be thrown. No gunshots, no bombs, nothing. Evil will be annihilated by the word that comes out of Christ's mouth. By the sword, the double-edged sword, the, the, the sword of the Spirit. His word will declare death on all evil and it will be annihilated at the battle of Armageddon. Amen. Defeat of global evil, worldwide corruption, which is what? The fall of spiritual Babylon, and it'll be all at the battle of Armageddon. Amen. The destruction of the false church, that'll be a very, it, it's represented in the book of Revelation by the great whore or the great harlot who rides the beast, which, which implies that she, the false church, is getting power from the beast or from the Antichrist. That's important to understand that. It symbolizes that that's where she's getting her authority and power, even to perform miracles in some cases. Amen. Then the lake of fire, the final demise of Satan and the Antichrist will be introduced after the battle of Armageddon. Got to remember that uh, so much evil will be annihilated, but then God's going to say, all right, the Antichrist, the false prophet, they're the first ones that will be thrown in to the lake of fire. Amen. Throwing in of the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. Boy, I'll tell you, that's, that's going to be a, a, that'll be a huge event. I mean, fantastic event. I get delighted even thinking about it because there's so much power, so much power that they had and they, and they, they hurt so much. It was so incredible, so incredible. But at the same time, there's going to be something fantastic happen at the same time where this binding of Satan will come for a thousand years. Amen. Jesus himself will bind Satan and throw him into the bottomless pit and he will be bound up for a thousand years. Amen. During the millennial reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years. Can you imagine that? I, I just, I just... I just can't even hardly process this in my mind. It's, it's so incredible when you think about it. The throwing in of the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. And then Satan won't be thrown into the lake of fire quite yet. That'll be later. But he will be bound up into a bottomless pit. Into a bottomless pit. Yes, it'll be an incredible event that Satan will be thrown into a bottomless pit during the millennial reign of Christ which will last for a thousand years. And I have teaching on that also on our YouTube channel. Go listen to that message on what the millennial reign of Christ is all about. Amen. And then, of course, after that, there will be another resurrection. And this is called, in the book of Revelation, the second resurrection. And the Bible says, Blessed are those that take part in the first resurrection, but woe unto those who are taking part in the second resurrection. The first resurrection is, is, is the resurrection of the saved. Amen. And uh, it'll be happening at, the, at the, the rapture of the church where we'll all be caught up and taken to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But the second resurrection will be the resurrection of the lost where they had been in a holding pattern during the millennium period and then they will be resurrected to stand before the great white throne judgment. Now, this is really important. The judgment of the lost, the separating. Oh, my. This will be a, a devastating thing to see. Amen. I don't personally believe that any of us, the saints of God, the church, the true church, will even have access to even see what will happen at the great white throne judgment. I don't believe that. I think that would spoil our time. I don't believe that we will have witness to that at all. Amen. Even though the Bible is silent on that, but I just don't believe that God will allow us to see it. And then, of course, there is an event that may surprise you that there will be a destruction of the first heaven and earth. Okay. And there will be a revelation of a new heaven and new earth. Amen. 
And that's what, if you read, you know, the 19, 20, 21, 22, those chapters in the book of Revelation, it starts explaining the, um, the heavenly splendor of the new heaven and new earth. <laughs> it's going to be phenomenal. I don't think it's, it's even possible to comprehend what this revelation that John saw on the new heaven and the new earth. And of course, we know in the 22nd chapter, Christ promises that he will come back quickly. Amen. <laughs> I was just so excited to share this little broad picture, the, uh, uh, you know, the big picture, I want to call it, or the broad picture, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it, it just, it just gives us a little thumbnail sketch of the book of Revelations. And uh, we'll be doing a lot of in-depth teaching in each one of these categories. And, and, uh, and we already have done that. Go out on our YouTube channel and you'll see a lot of that teaching is already out there. And uh, we'll continue to do it this year. But I'm just so excited about this whole thing because I know that God is making this clear. He's making it like this is revealed. It's not mysterious. It's, it, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's just so incredible what God has planned for his people. Amen. So I trust that that blessed you today. And uh, uh, let's just wrap up with prayer. Thank you, God, for all that you've done. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for all that you have done for us, the hope of eternal life we have. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Lord, thank you for all your wonderful plans for us. They're beyond what we can even imagine. And Lord, I pray that you will bless now the people of God, bless the people of our church and anyone who is listening to this video at this time, Lord, or any time, may the blessing of God just fall upon them. May the power of the Holy Spirit and the revelation power of the Holy Spirit fall upon them so that they will receive Christ. If they haven't received Christ, and if you never made that decision, what better time than right now? Why would somebody say no to eternal life? Why would somebody say no to the glory and the power of the Holy Spirit? Just, you know, not only blessing you in this life, but the hope of what's ahead. The millennial reign of Christ, the new heaven and new earth, the, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why would, why would you say no to that? when it's all bought and paid for by what Christ did on the cross. It's yours. Just like God told Joshua, I've already given you the land. Go in and take it. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying to you now. Christ has already paid the price. Just get ready and go in and enjoy eternal life. Enjoy the wonderful things of God. Let's just pray together right now. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved and I need a savior. I can't save myself. I can't forgive my own sin. So please forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me of my sin and I receive your free gift of salvation. I accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal savior and Lord. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that you will renew our spirit Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with a, a saturation of the Holy Spirit so I will know and feel you, Lord, and understand you like I never have before. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I trust that you prayed that prayer with me, and if you didn't, you need to make that decision as quickly as possible. So important. The time is short. What must be done must be done quickly. We love you all. Take care. Have a wonderful night. And we'll see you on the weekend. Take care and God bless. Bye-bye.